the reuniting of two kingdoms in the latter days. Having just reviewed a brief summary of the ancient division of the United Kingdom of Israel and the fact that Joseph Smith and the Twelve Apostles were instrumental in grafting some branches together of the two houses of Israel during the LDS Restoration Movement, let us now review some of the ancient prophecies that foretold the reestablishment of the United Kingdom of Israel and the reemergence of the Davidic dynasty. It's important to realize that according to ancient prophecy, one of the things that the Davidic descendant of David does is to reunite the two kingdoms together again. This is largely what Joseph Smith was doing when he established foreign missions. Listed below are some of the Old Testament prophecies relating to the reuniting of the two general branches of Israel. Keep in mind that the reuniting of the two kingdoms is a process that takes over a substantial period of time. It began during Joseph Smith's ministry in the Second Watch but is not finalized until the return of God's servant and the beginning of the marvelous work in the third watch. Zechariah, quote, And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. End of quote. Jeremiah, quote, In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, with continual weeping they shall come, and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion, and their faces toward it, saying, quote, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. End of quote. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least to them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. End of quote. Ezekiel. Quote, the word of the Lord came unto me, again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it, for Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto them, saying, Wilt thou not show unto us? What thou meanest by these, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even the stick of Judah, and make them one stick. And they shall be one in mine hand, and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither thou shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. End of quote. Next, Isaiah, quote, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and approve with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, 
and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an enzyme for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together to disperse of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. End of quote. Another great secret is that Joseph Smith is the descendant of King David, who was to restore the two ancient houses of Israel back into one kingdom and establish the throne of J David, which was to continue until the secret return of the Lord of the vineyard and his servant. Now let's go back to the Old Testament passages and drill down a little bit regarding God's promises to King David. An important part of the King David storyline is that, the da that David desired to build a house for the Lord to dwell in, but did not build it because the Lord would not allow David to do so. Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to live in. End of quote. Bible scholars do not agree as to why the Lord did not allow David to build the house, although some believe that it's because of wars and the shedding of blood in which David had been involved. It becomes clear from the text and from hindsight of thousands of years that it was not the appointed time for the particular house of which the Lord was speaking. It's documented in both 1 Chronicles 17 and 2 Samuel 7 that through Nathan the prophet, the Lord told David about a descendant of his who would build a house for the Lord and that the Lord's people would not be moved out of their place anymore. 1 Chronicles 17, quote, Also I will drain a place for my people Israel and will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place <clears throat> and shall be moved no more, neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more as at the beginning, end of quote. 1 Chronicles 17, 9. It's apparent from history, as documented in the Bible, the Lord was referring to a time in the latter days when he would plant his people in their appointed time, and they would be moved no more. It nevertheless appeared at the time it was given, as if the Lord is referring to the reign of David's son Solomon. A few passages later, however, the Lord informs David that a descendant of his will be raised up and the Lord would establish his kingdom. Quote, and it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it from him that was before thee. But I will settle him in mine house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. That's in First Chronicles. Again, the above prophecy is speaking about the emergence of a descendant of David, whose throne will be established forevermore in the last days. The same narrative is contained in Second Samuel 7, but in greater detail. Quote, Moreover, I'll appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused, caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I'll set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. 
Thy throne shall be established forever. End of quote. We previously established the fact that the above prophecy is not speaking of Jesus as the literal fulfillment. He can only be considered a vague shadow fulfillment because he never committed any sin. We also know that cannot be speaking of Solomon because it was not chastened by the rod of man and he was not successful in indefinitely establishing the throne of David. The kingdom was divided during the reign of his son. It's true that many Bible scholars erroneously assume that the descendant spoken of is referring to Solomon. Indeed, it becomes evident that David thought the prophecy was referring to his son, Solomon. Indeed, the Lord does inform David that his son Solomon would build a house with a conditional promise that if he remained faithful, his kingdom would endure and he would be the one to fulfill the prophecy in its fullness. David's son Solomon also assumed the prophecy was about himself, and during the dedication of Solomon's temple, he pronounced himself to be the fulfillment of the prophecy and then petitioned the Lord to verify it. The dedicatory prayer is very much worth reading. It's remarkable how the dedicatory prayer in the Kirtland Temple mirrors it in several ways. That leaves us with a couple of pertinent questions to be asked. One, does the Lord verify that Solomon is the descendant of King David, who is to build the temple of the Lord? And two, does the remainder of Solomon's life fit the prophetic profile of the prophecy? The answer is no on both accounts. With regard to the verification that Solomon requested from the Lord, the Lord spoke to Solomon for the second time as follows, quote, And it came to pass, when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house, which thou hast built, to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and wilt keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of my kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. And this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house which is high, every one that passeth by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss, and they shall say, Why hath the Lord done this unto this land and to this house? And they shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them, and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all that is evil. That's in First Kings 9. As you can see the Lord's promise to Solomon that the kingdom would be established forever with the king on the throne over the United Kingdom of Israel was a conditional one with a stern warning that if Solomon should turn from the Lord and serve other gods and worship them, then the Lord would cut Israel off out of the land, defile the temple, and the United Kingdom of Israel would be cast out of the Lord's sight and would become a proverb and a byword. Needless to say, that's exactly what eventually happened. Solomon did sin, and his kingdom was divided as a result. Provided below are five places where the promise from God to David is mentioned, regarding a descendant of David who would establish the throne of David. The following table shows side-by-side -side comparisons of the initial Davidic promise, the two accounts of David asking for verification from the Lord that he was the one to fulfill the prophecy, and the two accounts of the conditional verification that God gave him. Bible scholars often get mesmerized by these accounts and neglect to focus on the hard reality that Solomon failed to meet the terms of God's conditional promise. Okay, it's got the scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> quote, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. End of quote. 1 Kings 9, 5. You'll have to read the book to find these two charts. He'll explain it right after here. After Solomon became very wise, wealthy, and famous, he married pagan wives and forsook the Lord, worshipping other gods. 
the Lord revokes the promise as it relates to Solomon. Following Solomon's transgressions, the Lord spoke to Solomon a third time, informing him that he had not been faithful and that his kingdom would be torn from him during the reign of his son. Quote, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my commandment and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in the days, in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Clearly, the dynasty was broken during the reign of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and Ephraimite, who was not from the direct line of David, took part of the kingdom. It became known as the kingdom of Israel. Although King Solomon might be considered a partial shadow fulfillment of the Davidic prophecy in 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17, he was not the literal fulfillment. There would be a descendant of King David in the last days who would reestablish the dynastic kingdom of David. Furthermore, we learn from the above passages that the Lord had promised David that, after the establishment of his latter-day descendant, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. End of quote. We shall now demonstrate that Joseph Smith is the literal fulfillment of the prophecy and the promise that, quote, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. End of quote has huge implications regarding those that succeeded the prophet Joseph Smith in presiding over the Latter-day Saints. The Lord's House versus David's House The literal fulfillment of the Davidic prophecies contained in the Old Testament is among the most misunderstood and tortured prophecies in the Bible. Those prophecies have specific reference to a Latter-day descendant of David, not to King Solomon, and clearly not to Christ. Christ never committed sin. Solomon did not establish the throne forevermore. Because of his transgressions, his kingdom became divided during the reign of his son. Modern revelation is pregnant with references to the reestablishment of the Davidic dynasty through Joseph Smith Sr. Joseph's House Notice in the passages above that the Davidic servant builds the Lord a house for the Lord's kingdom on earth, and conversely, the Lord makes the Davidic servant an house referring primarily to promises regarding his poster posterity, as well as a physical structure. This cryptic wordplay takes on more clarity when it shows up in modern revelation. Notice what the Lord says about Joseph Smith's house, or posterity, having the same blessing of having the right to have a place in the physical boarding house of the Lord. Quote, and now I say unto you, as pertaining to my boarding house, which I commanded you to build for the boarding of strangers, let it be built unto my name, and let my name be named upon it, and let my servant Joseph and his house have place therein, from generation to generation. For this anointing have I put upon his head, that his blessing shall also be put upon the head of his posterity after him. And as I said unto Abraham concerning the kindreds of the earth, even so I say unto my servant Joseph, In thee and in thy seed shall the kindred of the earth be blessed. Therefore, let my servant Joseph and his seed after him have place in that house from generation to generation forever and ever, saith the Lord. The Lawgiver over the House of Israel Just as the term house is used to refer to Joseph Smith's posterity after him, as similarly used in the passages referring to King David and his house, Hiram Smith is also given a promise pertaining to lineal priesthood that came to him by right and blessing. It's from this lineal priesthood of Hiram's that William Law is granted priesthood office in the room of Hiram. Quote, and again, verily I say unto you, let my servant William be appointed, ordained, and anointed as counselor unto my servant Joseph in the room of my servant Hiram that my servant Hiram may take the office of priesthood and patriarch that was appointed unto him by his father, by blessing and also by right, that from henceforth he shall hold the keys of the patriarchal blessings upon the heads of all my people. And that's in DNC 124. The Secret Doctrine of the Davidic Bloodline
One of the best kept secrets of the LDS restoration is the fact that Joseph Smith was a direct descendant of King David, Jesse, and Judah. This seems odd and unlikely because virtually every indication of Joseph's tribal heritage that has been made public informs us that he comes from Joseph and Ephraim. Nevertheless, if one drills down deep enough, it's not difficult to gather the missing pieces of the puzzle relative to the fact that he was of mixed lineage. Perhaps the obvious clue as to the secret identity is found in his patriarchal blessing given by Oliver Cowdery. Notice the following declaration and then compare it to the snippet from Judah's patriarchal blessing from his father, Jacob. Quote, By the keys of the kingdom he shall lead Israel into the land of Zion, while the house of Jacob shouts for the dance and in the song. He shall be a lawgiver to Israel and shall teach the house of Jacob the statutes of the Most High. In his hands shall the Urim and Thummim remain and the holy ministry, and the keys of the evangelical priesthood, also for an everlasting priesthood forever, even the patriarchal, for behold, he's the first patriarch in the last days. He shall sit in the great assembly and general council of patriarchs and execute the will and commandment of God under the direction of the Ancient of Days. End of quote. As you can see, Joseph will return to lead Israel into the land of Zion with the keys of the kingdom that he holds, just as prophesied in sections 101 and 103 of the DNC. But notice also that he shall also be the lawgiver to Israel. That biblical term is very definitive and revealing. Now look at the promise to Judah, quote, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, end of quote. As you can see, the right to the scepter of leadership over Israel and the calling of lawgiver over the twelve tribes belongs to Judah. Joseph Smith's patriarchal blessing is clearly identifying him as the last great lawgiver over all of Israel who sits directly under Father Adam in authority. That would make him the last great Davidic servant leading up to Christ. Clearly, he has to be from the loins of Judah as well as Joseph. The scepter of power. The term scepter is also a term used to describe the rights of Judah that is also verified in the blessing from the father, Jacob, to his son, Judah. And the Lord refers to Joseph's scepter in scepter, section 121 when teaching him about the righteous use of priesthood authority. These provide additional clues to the identity of the one mighty and strong. The term scepter is also used in describing Joseph's return as the one mighty and strong in section 85, as follows, quote, And it shall come to pass that I, the Lord God, will send one mighty and strong, holding the scepter of power in his hand, clothed with light for a covering, whose mouth shall utter words, eternal words, while his bowels shall be a fountain of truth, to set in order the house of God. One of the apparent discrepancies explained by modern revelation and the restoration movement, having to do with the blessings that Israel gave to his sons, has to do with the fact that Judah clearly held the right to reign over Israel. Yet Joseph's blessing revealed that from his loins would come, quote-unquote, the shepherd, also referred to as the, quote-unquote, stone of Israel, and that the blessings of his progenitors would be on the, quote-unquote, crown on his head, implying that he would reign over Israel. This narrative, of course, is reiterated when Joseph has a few prophetic dreams that he shares with his brethren, indicating that they would all bow down to him. After hearing his first dream about the sheaves of his brethren all bowing down to Joseph's sheaf, his brothers angrily replied, quote, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have a dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. End of quote. That's in Genesis 37. This was very offensive to his older brothers, and especially to Judah the oldest, since he held the right to rule. Displaying a lack of diplomacy after the first response, Joseph shares a second dream with his father and brothers. Quote, behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon, the eleven stars, made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. End of quote. <clears throat> Although these dreams were typologically fulfilled when Joseph was sold into Egypt and became a leader who would eventually rule over them, 
In a sense, as he helped his brothers and parents during a time of famine, the literal fulfillment is obviously future and literal. Judah's blessing not only informs us that Judah has the right to the scepter to be the lawgiver, it informs us that he has the exclusive right to gather Israel. Quote, Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. End of quote. That's in Genesis 49. It's no coincidence that Joseph Smith was given the keys to the gathering of Israel. Quote, After this vision closed, the heavens were again opened to us, and Moses appeared before us, and committed unto us the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth, and the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. End of quote. It appears that Joseph's lineage through Judah and King David was supposed to be kept a secret until just before the events of the marvelous work take place. In hindsight, as we review all the amazing information that is now so easily made available through search technology, we can see that Joseph Smith meets all three of the criteria listed in Judah's blessing. One, he's the lawgiver. Two, he holds the scepter of power. Three, he gathers the people. In addition to the above three criteria, Joseph Smith is the one who reunites the divided kingdom, which is also one of the roles played by the Davidic servant. Clearly, Joseph Smith is of mixed lineage. He's not only of Joseph through Ephraim, but also of Judah and King David. The fact that Latter-day Servant is of mixed lineage is what Isaiah 11 is speaking about, and that is why Joseph Smith expounded on those passages to clarify that the Davidic servant is from both Jesse and Ephraim. Quote, what is the root of Jesse spoken of in the 10th and the verse and the 11th chapter? Behold, thus saith the Lord, it's a descendant of Jesse as well as Joseph, unto whom rightly belongs the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom for an ensign and for the gathering of my people in the last days. End of quote. Reestablishing the Davidic dynasty. Although apologists come up with many creative motivations for Joseph Smith's involvement in polygamy, one of the most profound yet best kept secrets is that Joseph was aggressively taking on wives in an effort to reestablish the Davidic dynasty as was anciently prophesied. Joseph's most widely known revelation on polygamy is contained in section 132 because it was canonized by Brigham Young. However, people erroneously assume that was the only revelation on polygamy. Because of this, they assume it was the only authoritative template from which to determine the original doctrinal explanation upon which polygamy was revealed. Hence, they use section 132 as the exclusive template from which to understand Joseph's motivations with regard to the practice. The other revelation on polygamy is one that Joseph presented to Newell K. Whitney, explaining how Bishop Whitney was to perform the ceremony of giving his daughter to Joseph in marriage. The doctrinal narrative presented in that revelation provides a total disconnect when compared to the narrative contained in section 132. The Whitney revelation had a completely different motivational narrative of entering into polygamy than section 132 provides. Joseph apparently was led to believe that part of his process of establishing David's ancient throne in the last days in fulfillment of ancient prophecy necessitated the grafting together of various ancient bloodlines through the marriage covenant. Notice the following snippet from the revelation that Joseph delivered to Noel K. Whitney containing the verbiage to be used as he married Joseph Smith to his daughter, Sarah, quote, All these things I do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through this order he may be glorified, and that through the power of anointing, David may, be, may reign king over Israel, which shall hereafter be revealed. End of quote. The revelation is obviously revealing that Joseph needed to wed Miss Whitney in order that, quote, David may reign king over Israel. End of quote. It would appear from the above snippet that the sole motivation for polygamy in this particular situation had to do with the reestablishment of the Davidic dynasty. The revelation spoken of this great honor coming to the Whitney family because of the, quote, the lineage of my priesthood, end of quote, and the holy progenitors by the right of birth, end of quote, and, quote, powers to concentrate in you and through your posterity, posterity forever, end of quote. Clearly, this revelation was promoting polygamy in the context of merging bloodlines and creating a dynastic power base based on Davidic bloodlines and the merging together of the two houses of Israel that had been split in ancient times. It's clear from the statements made by Joseph Smith's successors that Joseph told them 
that not only he, but many of them as well, had the blood of Davidic royalty running through their veins. During a solemn assembly held on the 2nd of July in 1899, President George Q. Cannon made the following declaration, which was afterward confirmed by President Lorenzo Snow, quote, There are those in this audience who are descendants of the old twelve apostles, and shall I say it? Yes, descendants of the Savior himself. His seat is represented in this body of men, end of quote. Other general authorities have made similar statements. Heber C. Kimball believed that he was personally a literal descendant of Jesus Christ. Although this doctrine has largely been kept secret, it has not always been quite so hidden. Victor L. Ludlow was one of the more recent LDS scholars to let the cat out of the bag. He has mentioned in his writings that, quote, a number of the brethren, including Joseph Smith, claim that they shared lineage with Jesus in the tribe of Judah, end of quote. Editorial note. I provide this information for purpose of context, historical documentation, and a full disclosure of what was taught and believed by some of the early brethren. My personal opinion, after searching the scriptures, is that Jesus did not have physical offspring during his earthly ministry because he was not conceived through carnal intercourse. Neither did he have human blood flowing through his veins. The inspired version informs us that he was conceived differently than mortals. Quote, he was not born of blood and before that is a bracket, mortal blood. The Book of Mormon confirms the fact that his, quote, great and last sacrifice, end of quote, would not be a, quote, a sacrifice of man, for it shall not be a human sacrifice, but it must be an infinite, infinite and eternal sacrifice, end of quote. All of the standard works testify that Christ was literally God in the flesh. It seems unlikely and unnecessary to me that God would have carnal sex with a woman and have mortal children with human blood, when in fact he did not have human blood. It seems to me that the claims of men to be the literal offspring of God may well fall under the topic, strong delusion. End of quote. I do, however, believe that Joseph Smith, members of the Quorum of the Twelve, and other converts in the Restoration had the blood of King David flowing through their veins, and that the ancient house of David and the kingdom of Israel has been reestablished through the instrumentality of Joseph Smith end of bracket, end of the note by the author. It's interesting to note that on March the 17th of 1963, a fellow by the name of J. Rick Smith from Burbank, California, wrote a letter to Joseph Fielding Smith asking him what Isaiah 53.10 was speaking about. Quote, he shall see his seed, end of quote. He was obviously looking for verification that Jesus had physical offspring. He was probably surprised when he got the following reply from President Smith, quote, Mosiah 15, 10 through 11, please read your Book of Mormon, quote, and now I say unto you, who shall declare his generation? Behold, I say unto you, that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his, his seed. And now what say ye? And who shall be his seed? Behold, I say unto you that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, I say unto you that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for remission of their sins, I say unto you that these are his seed, or they are the heirs of the kingdom of God. End of quote. The fact that Joseph Smith saw himself as the Davidic servant establishing a kingdom is identified not only by his polygamous attempts at merging together family bloodlines to reestablish a dynasty, but also in his attempt to establish the political and military kingdom of God, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. On March 11th of 1844, he had himself anointed as king of Israel, and he established the Council of Fifty, which was meant to be a political kingdom. Various quotes from historians and authors are provided below to provide additional information. Quote, Joseph Smith established a secret organization called the Council of Fifty in Nauvoo, Illinois, which was designed to carry out his plans for political empire. This theocratic political kingdom or body of men met a number of times in Nauvoo before Joseph's death on June of the 27th of 1844. The goal of this theocracy was world government. They further believed that they would govern and rule the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. On April 11, 1844, the Council of Fifty installed Joseph Smith as king on the earth. This theocratic political body believed they were receiving God's law for the whole earth. 
On January 1st, 1845, William Clayton summarized the goals and accomplishments of this council during 1844. End of quote. And then again, quote, the organization of the kingdom of God on the 11th of March last is the one important event. This organization was called the Council of Fifty, or Kingdom of God, and was titled by Revelation as follows, quote, Verily, thus saith the Lord, this is the name by which he shall be called, the kingdom of God and his law, with the keys of power thereof and the judgments in the hands of his servants, Amen Christ. End of quote. In this council was the plan arranged for supporting President Joseph Smith as a candidate for the presidency of the U.S. presidential. President Joseph Smith was the standing chairman of the council and myself the clerk. In this council was also devised the plan of establishing an immigration to Texas and plans laid for the exalta exaltation of a standard and ensign of truths for the nations of the earth. In this council was the plan devised to restore the ancients of the knowledge of the truth and the restoration of union and peace amongst ourselves. In this council was President Joseph chosen as our prophet, priest, and king by Hosannas. In the council was the principles of eternal truths rolled forth to the hearers without reserve, and the hearts of the servants of God made to rejoice exceedingly. It's really quite remarkable that after Joseph Smith had had himself ordained king of Israel, Brigham Young and John Taylor had themselves anointed King of Israel upon becoming sustained as president of the church. It is possible that the secret rite has continued to this very day that the leading brethren of the church secretly continue to believe that they are the vessels of the holy bloodline from King David through Jesus and the twelve apostles. Nevertheless, that ordinance is unnecessary since an ordination to provide, uh, preside, over the Latter-day Saints is essentially an ordination to have divine authority. It's no secret that entrance into the highest quorums of the church have largely taken into consideration what lineage a person comes from. This is why virtually all the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve can trace their ancestors back to Nauvoo. A recent LDS author has taken issue with the good old boys club that requires people to be of a certain lineage in order to become one of God's anointed. Nevertheless, he and others experiencing this jealousy may not be fully aware of the deeper reason as to why this is important to the brethren. If, in fact, the two houses of Israel were being reunited and the ancient throne of David was secretly being established after the fullness of the gospel was rejected in order to keep the roots of the tree alive until the marvelous work could begin, then certainly bloodlines are important and the reestablishment of the ancient kingdom of Israel does have its purpose. It may be considered snobbery and even a form of racism, but the highest councils in the church possibly have a long secret tradition of viewing themselves as the elect and elite of God through the bloodline of King David, Jesse, and Judah. <clears throat> there are lots of people, including myself, who question the status of church leaders as prophets, seers, and revelators. Nevertheless, those who are privy to these secret things having to do with ancient bloodlines realize these leaders who sit in the seat of Moses currently hold the, quote, legal lease, end of quote, until the servants come back, quote, and when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, he will destroy those miserable wicked men and will let, uh, brackets, lease, again his vineyard unto the other husbandmen, even in this last days, who shall render him the fruits in their seasons, end of quote. There have been a long line of people claiming to be prophets in an attempt to set the church in order and establish a Zion community. There are also those who consider themselves learned in Hebrew and in ways of the Jew, who look down their noses at what they consider to be the lowly and uninspired Gentile and Ephraimite saints as being unable to receive personal revelation. Some of these folks authoritatively declare that Joseph Smith and his successors cannot be of the Davidic bloodline because they descend from Joseph. These people categorically reject Joseph as the Davidic servant based on their false perception of his lineage. These folks have a surprise awaiting them. We're informed that when the light shines forth for the last time, it will first go to and be rejected by those who sit in darkness. Quote, and when the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel, but they receive it not. For they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. End of quote. And that's in DNC 45. Just as the kingdom of the Jews had previously been established to greet Christ in the meridian of time, 
I'm going to suggest that the kingdom of Israel, currently presided over by Jews, has once again been reestablished to greet him and his servants when the last restoration takes place in the third watch. Prophecy has been happening all around us. Very few people see it. Joseph Smith gave us the following view of what is about to take place. Question. What is to be understood by the two witnesses in the 11th chapter of Revelation? Answer. They are two prophets that are to be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days, at the time of the restoration, and to prophesy to the Jews after they are gathered and have built the city of Jerusalem in the land of their fathers. End of quote. And then, quote, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. End of quote. Genesis 49. It's fascinating to consider that the genealogy of Mary, the mother of Jesus, which is found in Luke chapter 3, shows that it bypasses King Solomon and comes through Nathan. Mary's line bypasses King Solomon, the cursed royal line, and goes through Nathan, Solomon's brother. Although Nathan never became a king, he was still a descendant of David. Because of this, it appears that Jesus was born of what is sometimes referred to as the legal line of David's descendants through Mary, but not the royal line. One of the confusing things about Christ's lineal bloodline, right to the Davidic throne, is that the New Testament documents Christ's legal and royal right to the throne through both Mary and Joseph's lineage. One has to wonder why Joseph's Davidic lineage has any relevance to Christ given the virgin birth and the fact that Joseph does not appear to be the literal fleshly father of Christ. Given this scenario, one of two conclusions might be made. One is that Christ inherits the heritage of Joseph through the law of adoption, which is such a central theme to the gospel of Christ, another rather bizarre but totally plausible possibility, as that even though sexual intercourse did not take place, it was still Joseph's seed that the Holy Ghost planted within Mary's womb while maintaining her virginity. End of quote. 